Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Chupp, and I'm uh, Associate Professor at Case Western Reserve University and the Director of the Community Innovation Network. And I have the great re uh, privilege of facilitating these community engagement uh, sessions around the care response with my great team, which includes J.P. Gralty, John Tetta, and Bernard, God or Godfred, uh, Amangua, yeah. Uh, and so I am excited to have this opportunity to talk tonight about our piloting of the community engagement uh, sessions in uh, this zip code. So our overview tonight is really to talk about the care response and the implementation of that and to get your feedback as a community. So there'll be a presentation about the care response, there'll be a question and answer period, and then we have two different activities. One is at your table, kind of like a little focus group where we're gonna ask you specific questions. And then we have an activity that we'll do on the wall where we get you to put some post-it notes and stickies and give an interactive kind of process about suggestions on how to implement this program. So that's a little bit about what we're going to do and then we'll come back and wrap it up all by seven o'clock. So the purpose of these engagement sessions is really to share with the community in the two zip codes, 44105 and 44102, what the care response pilot program is and to get your input on that. And so we'll look at what your specific opportunities and needs are in this neighborhood or neighborhoods in the zip code and uh, answer your questions to the best of our ability. We also want to get your input from your lived experience about what would make this program effective. What, how should it be implemented in terms of, of the responders? And then give you some feedback on how this uh, implementation is going to go. And so I'm going to turn it over to our uh, first presenter, who is uh, one of our graduates, I'm proud to say. Angela Cecis is uh, with the City of Cleveland and Senior Strategist for Public Safety and Health, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the initiative of the program, and and then we'll uh, go from there. Shameless plug. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so. Again, my name is Angela Cecis. I work for the Department of Public Health, working on crisis uh, response in the city of Cleveland, for the city of Cleveland. Um, and I just want to go over a little bit about why we're here today. Um, so since 2015, when the city came under a consent decree um, in an effort to improve our law enforcement practices, Cleveland's taken steps to increase training for our officers and promote positive outcome outcomes during mental health and substance use related calls. Um, Part of that effort, uh, as we all know, uh, involves reducing law enforcement participation in, in certain calls and increasing the presence of specially trained mental health professionals instead. So the Adams Board approached the city of Cleveland um, this past fall uh, with their Care Response pilot initiative and we jumped at the ability to partner with them um, and bring this to Cleveland. Um, Mayor Bibb and the Cleveland Department of Public Health are committed to expanding and boosting our crisis system and services for our city residents. Um, and by working with the Adams Board and Frontline Service and our local crisis continuum partners um, to make the changes um, a reality and a success. Uh, so we utilized our first responder call data uh, from dispatch, dispatch calls, to determine where we would implement the pilot program in Cleveland. And in our 2023 uh, years worth of data that we had, um, 44102 and 44105 had the highest number of calls related to mental health, substance use, and, over and overdose in all of Cleveland. Um, so 44102 had the most on the west side and 44105 had the most on the east side. Um, so I just wanted to also recognize um, some great advocacy work by um, our community partners that have pushed for the city to take this step. Um, they include REACH, Care for CLE, Policy Matters Ohio, Magnolia Clubhouse, uh, our strategy group who's here today, Dr. Mark Hurst, uh, Lori D'Angelo, Pete Van Leer, uh, Coraline Schleifer, Josiah Quarles, and all those who have contributed. Uh, we wouldn't be this far along without your continued support and um, advocacy work, and um, we're continued to, um, 
we hope to continue to engage with you all and get your feedback. So we're so happy that you guys are here today. And um, I'll pass it over to Mackie. Yeah. So now we're going to hear from the Adams Board. And Scott Vasecki is not here tonight, uh, but uh, Miss Maggie Tolbert is, and she is the Assistant Chief uh, Clinical Officer and can lead us through a little bit about the background to this. And look, will you do this for me? I appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Thank you all for coming here. Um, Scott Osicki is the CEO of the Cuyahoga Adams Board, and he sends his regrets that he couldn't make it today, so I'm here. And as uh, Marcus stated, my title is Assistant Chief Clinical Officer at the Cuyahoga Adams Board. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what the Adams Board does. We have a crisis continuum, but part of our mission, of course, is to plan, fund, and monitor behavioral health services, and that includes mental illness and additional uh, addiction uh, services in Cuyahoga County. Next one. What is care response? So care response is a team. It's going to consist of a clinical licensed clinician as well as a peer. It is a unarmed behavioral health practitioners that will come out to wherever the crisis is. So it's services out in the community. And again, these are mental health services as well as addiction services. And sometimes you might hear me say substance use disorder or SUD services. This is without a police response. It is to come out for services that does not require um, an armed officer or a police officer um, or EMS at this time. This would be for nonviolent calls. Um, again, this is not for if you have someone who is stating they have a plan and they have a gun or they're going to hurt themselves or harm someone else, you will continue to call 911. With the care response team, we are emphasizing that you utilize 988. Um, care response is part of our crisis continuum right now. Um, we are doing the care response team in those two pilot areas that Angela had talked about, the 44102 and 44105. It will be where there will be someone to talk to, there will be someone to give you an immediate response and a place to go. Part of it is an initially what to expect when they come in, is that they will assess the situation. They also are very, um, um, empathetic to people's situations so that you become a part of your health care. Um, part of after the assessment that it may mean that you might need some ongoing services or linkage to ongoing services and this team will be able to help that. Um, Rick. Okay. It will be a 24-7 team. Um, they will help provide quick care and support, resolve the issue if they can on hand, or they will do warm handoffs to the people who can help. Um, it will be a rapid response. And it is to minimize law enforcement as well as ER use, as well as hospitalization, if all, that's the goal is to avoid that. If that is a level of care that the person needs, then they would also help to arrange for that. Next one, Rick. Why care response? It's to reduce the need for police involvement. Um, we want situations to be solved in the community, decrease hospitalization, less incarceration, improve safety, less crime in areas covered by care response, and an increased client involvement in treatment after crisis. And I do think that is a big thing. That has been a gap in our community um, when people are not feeling that they are part of their health care. This um, project has been well received by community and police, and it has demonstrated in other areas that it also can be cost effective. Next one, Rick. The work so far. So the Adam Board, in cooperation with the various partnerships that Angela had mentioned, but especially the uh, Cleveland Health Department, for the last three years with the help of our strategy, has been convening these meetings and getting feedback from um, citizens of Cuyahoga County regarding this project. Uh, there has been numerous focus group, community surveys, and um, our strategy did come up with a report and recommendation for a care response program in Cuyahoga County, and that's where we are today. 
and we are doing, again, this is a pallet in those two zip code areas. Next one, Rick. Um, again, who is doing this? The Adams Board in partnership with the City of Cleveland, Department of Public Health. What it is is a pallet care response program for adults, so that's 18 and over. Um, and it's in the area code in Cleveland of 44102 and 44105. We are expecting for this uh, pallet project to start serving clients uh, later in 2024, hopefully um, late summer or beginning fall. They, uh, we wanted to make sure, so it takes a lot of planning for this, and we wanted to make sure that we try and get it right. So we took out the first six months of this year to do planning. Right now, the uh, provider is Frontline, and you'll hear from Rick later, but he's in the process of where he's doing hiring. Uh, they came up with job description and take into account the communities as well as the needs of the community. We developed these job description, and it was based on the recommendations and the reports, the feedback that we got back from the community. Part of this is also doing these community engagement meetings. I think this is our fourth, our third one that we have been doing. Um, and we plan to have a followed by 12 months of active service provision and evaluations. We are planning to assess the program effectiveness with a focus on quality measure and community feedback. Again, this is a pilot. Um, if it's affected and work, the goal is to expand it throughout Calhoun County. And that's all I have, but I just want to make sure, if I can, that this is for adults and please use 988. All right, now we'll hear from Rick Oliver for Frontline Services, and then we'll have a period of question and answers. So hold your questions until we get through. Good evening, everyone. Um, Rick Oliver, Director of Crisis Services. We are going to be the provider hiring the staff and overseeing the care response program uh, after getting into a contract with the Adams Board. So just to give you a sense of where this program fits into the crisis continuum, what currently exists right now. We currently have a crisis hotline, so 216-623-6888. Frontline has been operating that hotline since 1995. So that's, there's not changing, that's still the same, that's gonna be there. In 2005, we started taking calls on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. In July of 2022, 18, 20 months ago, that transition, that number transitioned over to 988. So now you can call 988. They wanted to make it just an easier number to remember to call because the 10-digit number was way too long. So now that number, and we are answering that number at our, at our site downtown along with the local hotline number. We do have, since 1995, we've had an ability to do a mobile crisis team. We only have a handful of people. We cover Cuyahoga County. It takes a while for us to get out there. We try and do same day services, but we do have a crisis response team to those numbers. The care response is gonna be, um, there's gonna be staff that are gonna be able to get respond quickly, especially during that pilot, because we're gonna be focused on the two areas that we're, we're targeting at the moment. Um, we do have a child response team, but this again, the care response is only for 18 and older which we have to say that several times. Um, we have a crisis stabilization unit and we do actually oversee part of the co-responder uh, in the city of Cleveland, along with Murtis Taylor. So 988, that's really what I'm here to talk about is 988. We want to get people to call 988 if there's a crisis, behavioral, any kind of behavioral issue. It could be a referral on information. It could be a, you know, just, a, just someone needs to talk for a while. Um, it is a wide range of reasons why you can call, which I'll get in a minute. But they, 988 is a national number. They're studying it. They've been doing it since 2005. They, they have demonstrated um, through research that people are less depressed, less suicidal, less overwhelmed, feeling more hopeful after contacting somebody at 988. So it's a very um, effective service. So these are some of the re examples that I put up that are some of the main reasons why people would call. Certainly suicide is one of the top reasons why people call. Either they're feeling suicidal or they know someone who's suicidal and they want to figure out how to help that person. That's the number one reason why people call at the moment. Feeling depressed and hopeless, um, talking about harming self or others. Some people 
injure themselves, not trying to kill themselves, but a self-injury that doesn't need attention, overuse of alcohol and drugs, hearing voices, delusional thoughts, not eating or sleeping, extreme depression, anxiety. So your basic, any kind of mental health symptoms at all um, is, is people will call about and we will un do our best to understand what's going on, help figure out what the next steps are. Sometimes it's just talking to, some just, it's just you know, talking through the, the situation. 80% of the people who call, it's just a phone call. And then we will sometimes call them back the next day, see how they're doing, make sure we'll provide re um, re re referrals to providers. Um, there's a lot of work that happens over the phone. And when someone needs something more, then we can send out the team, the crisis team, and and later this year, we'll be able to send out the care response team. Just some quick numbers, just to give you a sense of some data around the, what we did in 2023. You saw the numbers to the crisis hotline, 11,000. Um, the, the, the assessments we completed, 1,400. Admissions to the crisis stabilization unit, 295. And assessments done by the police corps responder team in Cleveland, just about 300. So that gives you a sense of what we're happening, and the care response is being added to that. That's it's another resource that we have in our county. So just a quick review of what training our staff receives before they go out, before they answer calls, before they go out um, and deal with anybody who's having problems. Um, first, mental health and basic mental health and substance abuse issues, education about engaging, strategies, de-escalation strategies, trauma-informed care, cultural humility, and anti-racism training, of course, suicide assessment training, recognizing some m basic medical issues so we can refer to 911 if we need to. And of course, we're always dealing with self-care. It's a stressful work, so we want to make sure the staff is taking care of themselves so they're prepared to take care of others. So again, just a couple of reminders. This has already been covered. Um, this is care responses without, this is licensed clinicians going out, not law enforcement. Um, there will be a total of five teams that will work 24-7 um, in those two zip codes. So when you add up the time, most of the time there's gonna be one team. Sometimes there'll be two teams during the kind of the daytime hours, but most of the time there'll be one team. And it's a licensed, counselor or social worker and a certified peer specialist make up the team that will be going out. And we are posting those positions now. We haven't hired these positions yet. We're still trying to um, re re uh, recruit people who are gonna do this job. Um, so, and we are re trying to recruit in the neighborhoods that we're gonna be serving as well. So when we come out, um, you know, it's, it's basically two people showing up and asking some questions, trying to understand what's happening, what the situation is, and then determining what's the next step. Does someone need to be in a hospital? Does someone need a doctor's appointment? Does someone need a, an appointment with a counselor? Um, what, are, what is the next step that that person needs? So we're gonna identify that and then work to connect that person to those services. And now I think we're at the question and answer period. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Maggie, and thank you, Angela. So this is your time to ask questions for clarification. We're gonna get your feedback in small groups, so just any questions you might have right now about clarification, about what you've heard so far and how the program is being uh, uh, piloted. And if we don't have questions, we can go right into the small groups. Um, what is, what would be the process for um, community members to be aware of the progress once the pilot program has begun? Like what would be the feedback loop with community uh, once the pilot program begins? Maggie? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if I'm 
If I'm understanding correctly, you're saying what would the process of um, providing community? And I think, Josiah, what you're going to ask, because I talked to Scott right before I left today about the advisory committee. So um, what the board has decided is that the, that's the role of the board. Um, anybody at any given time is, can give us advice, uh, can give us feedback about program. I get information all the time, our feedback from folks. But he's not going to have an advisory committee for this particular pilot at this time. But anytime you want to call me, um, um, I am currently the project manager for this pilot project for these two zip codes. You can give me a call. But I know at the last meeting that was asked, and so I had told um, them that I would get an answer about for him. He said that was a recommendation maybe that was in the um, feedback that was given at the time. But at this time, uh, he's feeling that the board is the advisory group. So you know about, because you have come to our meetings. <laughs> so we have open meetings on Wednesdays. And uh, the public is welcome to come to those. And uh, there's a public comment section in the beginning, as well as towards the at the end, that people give us advice. But just call us. And just to expand on that, um, our strategy is going to be partnered and contracted with Adam's yeah. board until at least the end of the year, as of now. Um, they're working on a website right now with um, a survey and a feedback form, so that'll be part of it. In regards to like getting information of like how the program is going and what the numbers look like, I don't think we've decided that yet. We haven't even had that conversation yet, but it's something that we can take to our next meeting to talk about. Well, I'm not even on the question, but it sounds similar to the, like the accident. I was, I was on the accident. And it was like I say, it sounded like it might be cousin. It could be cousin to the act team part going out and doing things. Oh, a, a, an act team, you have a caseload of people right. that you work with. Yeah, okay. And this is going to be a little different in that they're not going to work on going with people. Their job is to assess in the real time what's happening and then link to services. Okay. And then they'll, they'll be like linked to other providers, but they won't carry a caseload. So, act team, you know, you're, you kind of. I hear what you're right. saying, but you did treatment and ongoing. I will. Crisis won't do that. I right. remember no, okay. you're on that team. Yeah. Uh -huh. But um, like Rick was saying, it right. won't be a case look. This is strictly crisis. Okay. Oh, you the crisis you'll send out. Okay. Good clarification. Did I see another question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I guess it's more, it's maybe into the weeds a little bit more than the conversation today, but. Um, kind of about the processes of if someone needs to be transported somewhere, there'll be processes I'm assuming in place for like if, because this is a team of two, they probably can't take anybody places themselves, I would assume. The plan, if someone's willing to go, okay. you know, it's all about consent. Right. We're not taking anybody against their will anywhere. Right. But if someone's willing to go and that fits into what our plan is, if someone needs to go somewhere right now, We'll, we'll have the capability of transporting, if that right. makes sense in okay. the time. Okay. Yeah, because I know that that's a, a huge thing of not wanting to go with EMS if there's an alternative For sure. to that. Yep. that would be as long as it's a safe and, and it's part of the plan, then yeah, mm -hmm. we, we will be, we have the capacity to do that. Okay. Will there be any charge uh, for uh, the, the the patient at this point, as far as yeah. being one place to another, would that be like Medicaid, Medicare? So what are the great potential charges for this? We don't, we'll, we'll not charge the individual for anything. We don't bill anything. We do, if someone has Medicaid, we and, and it's an appropriate Medicaid eligible service, we can bill for that, but that there will be no charge. Nobody will see any bill. Uh, we're not gonna be billing the client or the individual at all. Excellent question. Yeah. Back here in the room. Have you, uh, you guys had a process in place for queuing and adding the providers or you know, like a master list or how are you sort of picking and choosing who you're going to offer the referrals to? Like different agencies. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to go? So currently, right now, the board contracts with over 70 providers. Okay. So um, usually that is what. But suppose you have a client that said, I don't want to go to any of those 70 providers. It's client choice. 
but we have a, a, a whole array of people who do different things. If you go on our website, that information is on the website about a list of all our providers and, and the services they offer and who they serve adults and children. And how would one get on that list? One is you have to have a contract with the Adams Board. Okay, the it. Adams Board usually once a year um, uh, contract out for services that may be changing okay. in terms of the length, but like this is 24, so for 23, we contracted for one year for 24. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I guess to piggyback off of that. Go, go ahead, Josiah. Yeah. Um, for, for folks who are out of network, if there was a um, community organization that have been providing a service for them that is not contracted with the Adams Board, is there a way where the pilot program can be aware of some of these rather than have to discover them on at the moment and try to vet it? Like, is there a process for that outside of what is registered with the Adams Board? There are, there are. I mean, crisis workers, co-responders, care responders, they all build up their own like lists of agencies and services. We have mass, like master lists of all the agencies in the community. Um, you just have to be aware of every single one and I think it's just something that clinicians do naturally. They just make sure they have their whole resource binder available to them. Um, and I would say that even though uh, like the Adams Board is a really good go-to website to find a provider, it is really like what's in the area, what, what the client wants, what's gonna work out best for them based on what their needs are. Yeah. And that would be a, go ahead. I'll just add that um, we're also not necessarily, not that we could be everything to everybody, but um, you know, we're not just behavioral health providers, we're social service providers. So if someone needs something, we'll look for an agency that can provide that service, even if it's not behavioral health. Uh, we're not gonna, you know, crisis, people get into crisis for all kind of reasons. And sometimes it's not, there's a primary maybe a mental health or a secondary mental health. There could be other things that are impacting that. And we'll try and help when we can. So that would be something to put on the last exercise we have tonight about what are the characteristics of a responder might be something around knowledge of other providers. So let's go here and then we'll come back. Um, yeah, my question was like, what type of uh, level of volume are you guys anticipating for the pilot? I'm just thinking through as I, I have a lot of peers on my team and just thinking through what this is like for them and, and everything. So. Uh, I, I, I don't know because the call is going to have to come through 988 for us to get to the care response. Okay. So that. It, I'm, I, it all depends on people calling 988, and so I'm, we're not sure about the volume. And we're only going to have a limited with only having 200 hours a week of service. You have five teams, 40 hours, 168 hours in a week. You only have 32 hours, but there's even two teams. So that team, if they're out and there's another call comes in, so there, we're going to have it's going to be the pilot is all about learning what is the, what is the need and what is the service that we need to put together. So this is just kind of a, let's see what's happening in the communities here and what what can we do initially, but what is the real need? And then we go to the, you know, the powers that be to say, can we build this team up to meet the need of the community? Maggie, did you want to add anything to that? Crisis is very difficult, at least my experience has been, it's very difficult um, to predict volume because it changes all the time with our other crisis providers. So it just depends. Yeah. What we're hoping is just to have the access that this is going to be something that's available at the time that people need it. And I assume there'll be some tracking of, of the intakes and how that how that progresses through the pilot. So the word of mouth is going to be important, probably. Yeah. And we'll get, yeah. Did you have another question? No. Well, now was the question I was asking is about when he's we made the statement about not on the Adam Board. It's because I work at Alliance Treatment Center, and we're not uh, Adam Board on the Adam Board. This we do dual diagnosis yeah. treatment. So I was like, I was wondering the same thing. How, yeah. you know, outside that ring. People know about you. Yeah, yeah. Know we about know about you. your agency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, All I right. Done a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> paid for. <laughs> the following message was paid for by no. 
So, so let's, uh, let's turn into the small group because some of these questions are, might be come up in the small groups and we will have uh, two groups. Let's say, you want, there's only, yeah, we just have somebody walk in. We're but there's eight people. Yeah, all right, whatever. Four and four? Yeah. There's only eight people. Yeah, right. right. Two groups, yeah. So one group here and then let's go back here with Godfrey. But before you move, um, these are, there's three questions and we're going to record these uh, conversations so that we don't lose any of the information. It's only for our internal purposes to, to have transcripts of what you said so we get your words in your words exactly. And, uh, and then we will use that to generate a report. What you say specifically by, will not be identified by your name or by your organization. Uh, so that will be there. And the three questions are, what are your hopes and expectations for this program in your community? Who would use this program and why? And what would make it more likely to call 988 versus 911? These questions are on your table and there's some group norms on there too. And I wanna start with, this is really an opportunity for those who are either live in 44102 or 44105 in this case, or work in those neighborhoods. So if you are actively working with people from those communities, we want you to participate. If you have a, more of a background role, then observe and let, let the folks that are, have the lived experience or working experience in these areas to participate. And then the norms are focus on the questions, make room for everyone to speak. You may even take turns and go around the circle. Uh, of your table and um, try to speak for yourself and not necessarily uh, and on behalf of the whole neighborhood, but do speak about the people you know. Um, you talked about your peers and if you have experience with your peers that you wanna share, that's, that's fine too. And then just follow the facilitator's lead. And we have about 25 minutes for this, so there should be plenty of time. So let's say one table here and one table back there and just shift to wherever you want to participate and we'll come back um, in 25 minutes for the next activity.